it's kind of an exciting time. Um, and I think what you're going to see today is what we've all been waiting for when it comes to, to 3D printable materials. Um, uh, I'm going to apologize, uh, kind of. Um, I have a little bit of a nasally. I actually um, it was uh, diagnosed with COVID. So uh, uh, I'm doing fine. Um, so the, would say it's a mild case. I haven't really had too many issues. I have a little congestion, so I'm a little nasally, but I'm doing fine for anybody who um, is just hearing this. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I have COVID, I'm at home, as you guys can see, but uh, luckily I feel perfectly fine to do this and uh, we'll get some good information shared with you guys today. So, um, you know, the one of the first, you know, one thing that would be great, and this is what I always told myself, was if we could just have a 3D printable material that was as good as what we have now, all right? And what I mean by what we have now is something that we pack or inject, you know, met methyl methacrylate based acrylic. It'd be great if, if when we 3D printed something, it looked as good and was as strong as those. And what you're gonna find today is we may have something that's even a little better than that, or in some instances, a lot better. Um, and so that's really exciting uh, as far as, um, you know, strength, wear re resistance, um, shade in certain instances we'll talk about, things like that. So it's a, a really exciting material. I'm going to go through some boring stuff, but some stuff that's important, just so you aren't just believing me when I say that this stuff is strong and has good characteristics that are that are nice for our industry. Um, I'm going to give you some stats just to kind of give you a little science, you know, a little scientific proof behind uh, just taking my word for it. But yeah, I mean, you have um, denture teeth, you have some 3D printable materials that are available now in Trisana, and this is water uptake or absorption of moisture, right? Something that's very important on, in our industry because it's a high moisture environment in the mouth, and you can see that denture teeth um, that we've been relying on for years and years and tens and twenties and you know centuries um, to be you know, stain resistant and resistance to absorption of moisture, we're actually a little bit better than that, right? So that's a huge advantage um, that we not only are as good, but even a little better than what we've been using and proven works fine for probably as long as a lot of us have been doing industry. Um, so here's our first um, strength. I'm going to move something you guys can't see so I can read. Um, so this is flexural strength. All right. And I asked some of the chemists that we have working for, for Meyerson, well, you know, you guys are, you know, have degrees in this and have studied this and understand this, but um, let me understand what exactly this means. And so we kind of put a definition, um, you know, just pulled it off the internet. But one thing that you can see here, our Trusana is the blue, and you can see our our, our uh, strength is much higher than some of the leading materials that are out there uh, by far. Um, but actually, you can see that some of the other materials dramatically drop when um, saturated over periods of time, whereas the Trisana basically stays the same. It has a slight change, but basically stays the same. And what this is, is it's flexural strength, also known as modulus of rupture or bend strength or transverse rupture strength is a material property defined as the stress in a material just before it yields in a fracture test. So this is bending it until it snaps. All right, so this is really good um, in our industry, right? Because as you know, People are going to uh, drop a denture base and step on an accident or, you know, in a mouth on soft tissue, we're not so worried unless it's on implants or something like that, right? But we know that's not where these fracture. It's not when the patient picked and bit into a piece of toast like we always hear and uh, a denture broke. Um, this is a really good example of something uh, that this material has that we use in our industry. Jumping over to a flexural modulus, all right? And again, this one was really pretty cool because again, we were much higher than them, which is important. But you can see we actually, as saturation happens over a period of time, we actually drop, but then we rebound back, 
right? So this material is really suited for the environment in which we're using it, which is high moisture. And the definition of this, in mechanics, the flexor modulus or bend modulus is an intensive property that is computed as the ratio of stress to strain in flexor deformation or the tendency for a material to resist bend. So if you look at those two that we just talked about, one is when you bend it until it snaps, right? It has really good um, amount of bend before it will snap. And then you jump to this one. This is actually the, the, the power, I guess you would say, that it has to resist bend. So we have um, uh, the fact that it can bend a good bit before it snaps, but it also is going to be nice and strong um, to resist even bending, so it's going to be nice and stable if whatever you produce with it. So just some really um, nice characteristics of the material for what we're using it. You know, if we were talking about making a car part, we might be concentrating on some other um, tests for strength. But those, I think, really dial in the, the you know, why this makes sense in our industry. Um, there's also some tests we've done that um, I'll be getting the feedback soon, and so you can look for future webinars. Hopefully, we'll be doing some longer, maybe some hour webinars where we can get into a little bit more of production, half an hour, almost like an, uh, an overview um, where we can really get into uh, the process of eluding teeth to base and things like that. But um, we've done some wear characteristics, uh, uh, wear resistant tests that have really been uh, great. And so um, we'll be able to give you feedback once we have everything laid out on that for sure. But as far as everything looks right now, the wear characteristics of this material, as far as the dentition, you know, the actual denture teeth that you make out of it is going to be up there with some of the most wear resistant denture teeth that you can buy pre-manufactured, which is exciting. Um, so just so you have an understanding right now, um, we have the denture uh, teeth, so teeth only, tooth shades available. The denture base is done. Uh, the formulation is complete. It's just going through FDA. It's been held up a little bit, but uh, uh, that should be through soon. I don't know about that part of it, but what they say tell me is it's soon, so I'm telling you that it's soon. But I have worked with the material and it, it really is a nice looking and we'll talk about that and you'll see that here in a little bit um, but we hope to have that denture base uh, coming out um, soon as far as printers the validations have come through for the spring ray and that's done i've been using spring ray for a year now with it and it works great sega is in the process i believe it's really close and the roland uh, 3d printer that one will be next in line so <clears throat> so we'll be working on those and, and more and more printers I'm sure will come down the line as we roll this out. Um, no guarantees. I don't know that part of the business. Um, I have my own lab. I, I just, uh, from what they I talk to me about. So if you have any questions about that, you'd want to probably contact um, you know, Myerson more directly on when and who, what different printers will be coming in the pipe. So right now, because we don't have a denture base to offer in production, I'm going to show you the denture base. Um, but, uh, you know, an option right now is to print the denture base uh, out of a different company's material. Um, that's a possibility as well as milling. You can mill the denture base and, uh, and then incorporate our Tursana uh, manufactured printed teeth uh, to it. And... Uh, that's a really good option. Um, I think you're going to find that the Tresana teeth have a, a good bit more translucency than you've seen in a lot of printable tooth colored materials so far. Um, a lot of other materials that are out there, from what I understand, to, to kind of get the strength, they kind of build in flexibility in the material. And in building in flexibility gives it kind of fillers. And those fillers are what kind of is the challenge of battling the opaciousness that you see in a lot of those teeth. Tresana um, can be clear um, and have all the same strength. You know, the material doesn't need any fillers or extra anything to be as strong as those ratings that I showed you. So that allows us a lot more ability to um, adjust the shade 
um, when making them, right? Uh, you know, I don't do that. But whenever the, they're developing the shades, they're allowed to. I mean, so just to give you an idea, I've received jugs of this material over the last two, almost three years. And I've had them come in where they are as translucent as like an Emacs high translucency ingot very translucent and i was like yeah guys this i mean it's kind of a nice idea but it ain't gonna work for denture teeth right um and then i had to come in way more opacious so they've really been playing around and they have the ability to play around with that which is a nice um, option to have with the material and i've also found like i'll show you in the end when you get into a discover i'm sorry a uh, uh opti delays situation where you want to highlight and, and kind of custom Customize the material because of the translucency really picks up a lot of the opti glaze and it really absorbs the color instead of looking like it's sitting on top. And I want to mean absorbed, it doesn't soak in. I mean, it, it just looks way more natural when you do use sort of an external uh, stain like an opti glaze. Uh, it really does nice. And so, you know, whatever mill you have, I mean, there's no real special strategies um you know uh, uh whatever you're having success as far as creating your base and your block out into the sockets and your print material you're going to be fine one thing i found just in my own experience don't make those teeth go too deep into that base um, you're going to have fitted issues uh, whether you're printing or milling the base um, there's you're just asking for some trouble there the trisana um, does bond to acrylics Nicely, uh, we do use a uh, little bond, a bonder from George Taub. I'll give you the name of it in a little bit. But um, I've also had pretty darn good luck, and I'm going to tell you this as nothing that's a company line um, and nothing that's been proven. Matter of fact, they're going through testing right now on bond uh, between Trisana and a base material, I'm kind of testing this. So I'm having scientific answers for you, but doing my lab kind of very unscientific testing that if I uh, treat the area with monitor and then add some acrylic to it, um, it, I kind of created a post, I could not snap it off of there. So you do get some sort of a nice bond, even with just prepping the area with a monitor and then processing acrylic to it. But the, the George Taub uh, bonder we know works really nice. So I would recommend you use that. But it is nice to know that acrylics will kind of bond to it because if a doctor doesn't know, like let's say the patient gets a Trisana denture once we have the denture base out in Virginia and then moves to Texas and it goes to a dentist and says, yeah, you know, five years later, my dentures fit loose, need a reline, and he doesn't know what this material was and he does a reline, it'll actually adhere to it probably just well, well enough to, to keep that reline in there for the life of the denture. So it's nice to know that that works like that. So here's, you know, just an example of the Trisana base material. This is our kind of regular kind of light pink. Um, we do have three different shades available. Once it's released, we have a Meharry, we have a reddish, and we have a, a, a lighter pink. And, you know, doing your milling is nice, and it is something you can do, and you can have the fibers in the base and different stuff because it's an acrylic, but, you know, the production, um, that you can accomplish on a nice sized bill plate. This is a spread ray bill plate. And we got eight on, you know, full dentures on their uppers. And, and those are the sets of teeth for them. I usually like to do my sets of teeth in quadrants. I find the fitting is, is easier. Um, also, you can kind of fit them on the bill plate easier. Um, so I just do the anteriors and then two posterior sections, and that's the way I like to do it. It's not that that's the way it should be done <laughs> by any means, but that's just where I've kind of dropped in and it seems to work out real nice. But it's definitely a time saver when it comes to being able to print. And so once we have the base available, I think um, that's going to make everyone real happy. Here's that George Taub. I'm going to I get it here. We get you the exact spelling of it. So it's George just as it sounds, G-O-R-G-E, T-A-U-B products. And uh, as you can see here, it's called Fusion and it's looks like it'll fuse just about everything um, in the math, you know, you know, different materials and, and stuff. But uh, yeah, definitely have found 
that this uh, makes for a nice pre-treat of the surface. And so it's a liquid. You have three jars in there. Uh, you take uh, equal drops from A and B and put them into the, the, the third jar. So like four drops would probably be good for a denture and teeth. Mix it up, let it uh, sit for, I think it's 15 minutes. And that's actually good for, I think it says three weeks. Um, so you could mix up a larger batch if you knew you're going to use it up. And then you just uh, paint the sockets and the undersides of the teeth anywhere that's going to come in contact and let it dry. I think they say for three minutes at least. And then you're ready to go. Um, you can use some, some composite-based bonding, but I would definitely use the bonder. But uh, a monomer-based um, bonding, you know, using an acrylic of sorts or something like that is also a nice option. There's a couple out there. Um, you just one thing that I found is, is if you have an acrylic that does mix up and get to a workable consistency nicely and fast, that's the best. You don't want it running on you. But you want it to have a like a toothpaste type consistency, and that's the best. Um, and so, yeah. Um, as far as processing, again, hopefully we'll get to do a video in the future where we'll get to go deeper. But we're already half through the halfway through this. And we'll be able to uh, kind of show you the process I go to. Maybe even I was thinking to shoot a video because it's just Q-tips and keeping those teeth in place. You can use some matrixes. You definitely want to not rely on those sockets being perfect. I'm sure you guys have run into that out there where you're going to have some fittage issues no matter how precise and it's hit or miss. Sometimes you get those teeth to drop in and they have no rock and everything looks perfect. And sometimes you have some adjusting into those sockets. Um, we have some ideas of ways to correct some of that, or at least to know what it is, um, whether we can correct it or not, that's, that's to be seen. But um, kind of creating some matrices, kind of um, if any of you guys went to dental lab school, um, you know, they would have you process your denture and um, do a, a patty on your articulator on the bottom, like if it's an upper denture, and you, almost like if you're doing like a, a reline on the jig, you'd sink the teeth into there. And then you finish your denture, and then you, uh, once you process your denture, you go back to that, and that's how you'd kind of tap it in and stuff. And that might be something that we're going to have to start doing with these to make sure that we have everything back in place. This would be you do the patty, lower it, clean everything up that holds the teeth in place so you know that you aren't going to have a misaligned bite once it goes back. Um, just some ideas. Uh, some other ideas are out there, but you know that is something that you have to be concerned with um, when uh, when dealing with 3D printed stuff. Um, so my process, so I push the teeth down in place, I clean up as much excess uh, of the bonding agent, whatever I use, as possible. And with a Q-tip, usually I'll use a Q-tip and I'll wipe all that away, but there's always, you know, the finer areas, it gets up into the interproximals of the teeth. It's, um, you know, you can only clean it so much. And so my process, and again, this is not to say this is the way everyone should do it or it's the best. I'll probably learn from some people that there's a better way. But I use, this is about maybe just a little bit smaller than a number eight. And I go around and I just clean the bulk. And I just kind of run around those necks and clean the bulk. Then I come in with just a bit smaller. It's about half again that size. And I go around again and I concentrate more just on that kind of uh, facial crest. I don't mess too much up in here. I just kind of run it up in there. At that point, I'll come in. I have a diamond disc, a real thin diamond disc. And I'll actually go ahead and separate a little bit, give it a little separation in between the units, and I'll run it down. And usually I'll slice into the papilla ever just a little bit, right? So as I come down, that disc will wind up just giving a little slice into that papilla. And that's okay, because then I come in with this really small round burr. I go around those necks really quickly, but I concentrate a little bit more up into that papilla and kind of clean, you know, smooth off that little slice that I put in and kind of bring it in so I get a little depth in there, but not so much depth that we're going to collect food. And, uh, you know, that's where I'll, I'll kind of end um, as far as, you know, the teeth and, and they'll all be in place and, and they're all cleaned up and ready for polishing. And so I think that it, it's working really well for me. Um, I could probably spend a little bit more time cleaning it with the 
you know, the Q-tips or maybe even get a brush and try to get all that out. But I feel like I'm going to have to go through this. Maybe I'll, I'll save a few minutes of me working with the burrs. Um, but I'll probably spend that same amount of minutes working with the brush and the Q-tip. So if that's, you know, uh, the way that you want to do, uh, spend your time, then great. Let me sure it'll work well as well. <coughs> so, um, and then, so this is a good example of how the material looks. You can see it has, a, it doesn't have that brightness, you know, that high value that you get with some of the, materials out there. I believe this is like an A1, so it's going to have a little bit of a, a value to it, just naturally the shade will. You can see the base material. And this is one of the nicest things is that it does have a nice translucency to it. It does have a, uh, you know, a much more uh, of letting that light through and allowing it to, to blend in. Uh, it doesn't have the veins and stuff like an acrylic would have, but it definitely gives you a nice, um, a nice look. I think it gives you a more natural look than what you would have with some of the you know other materials out there. Matter of fact, you know my experience with Duraflex, and if you haven't worked with Duraflex, that's a flexible you know base material. And dealing with the fact, so with a lot of flexibles, you have to the pigments that you can use are restrictive, right? We can only put certain pigments in the mouth. And there's only certain pigments that can handle 450 degrees when you injection mold flexibles. And so that's why a lot of flexibles that you'll come across out there are translucent is because they can only use so many or certain pigments. You know, the translucent turns out to be a, in most instances, a nice thing. Sometimes it can be a challenge dealing with the translucency, but most of the times it, it does a nice uh, cosmetic effect. Well, with acrylics, we never really went to that high translucency because I think it's because we just never really did. And I think patients and doctors are used to seeing it. But with this, it really does pick up the color of whatever tissues under it. It really will blend in nicely. So I think it's going to be a nice, nice addition uh, to what we can do. Polishing. Um, so you can pumice it. It pumices and polishes nice. I just recommend you use a brush a lot rather than a rag wheel. So if you do need some nice character, you'll keep it. Um, but the polishing kit um, that Meyerson has for their Duraflex and VisiClear and, and Proceedal actually works really nice on this material. And it is nice because you don't you got to get dirty. <laughs> um, this doesn't use any pumice. Uh, the abrasive is embedded in these bristle brushes. And so you start with yellow. Yellow and red are like your pumice. This is going to go to all your major tool marks and scratches out. And then you'll jump to your blue and green, and that's just going to bring it up to a little bit more of a shine. And then, of course, you'll high shine it with a rag wheel. With any denture polish that you use, the, the polish that we have for the Duraflex does work nice as well. But I found about any denture polish really brings it to a nice shine. Now, um, OptiGlaze, you know, some labs out there are going to decide to just polish it and have, you know, a nice basic denture, and some are really going to want to work some magic on it. Uh, OptiGlaze really works nice. And what I do is I go over with the smaller version, right? So that's the yellow brush. They actually sell those. Uh, Zonal sell them. They call them Habris discs. Um, it's not a Meyerson product. It's a small little mandrel sized one. And I go over with the yellow, which, like I said, is kind of like a pumice, and it roughens up the surface, but it also lets you get out any major scratches or any tool marks that you aren't going to want to show through with it. So I just go over that surface with that, and then this is what you can develop with it. And you can see here, you can get some, like I said, the OptiGlaze really shows some beautiful, um, uh, you know, when you put that OptiGlaze in there, it, like I said, when I say absorb, it's not soaking it in. It actually just really shines that through and really shows it beautifully. And you can see I put a little reddish in here to highlight that, a little, little uh, darker stain at the neck. And then you can uh, glaze it. Um, most uh, sealants will work. I think this one was actually palace seal. I went over top of the Opti Glaze, but any one of those are all very similar, work fine. And so, again, this is pretty much an overview 
of the material. Hopefully this gets you excited about it. And like I said, I'm sure look to the future. We'll have some, some maybe some hour webinars put together. It'll get into a little bit more of the processing and, and getting into some bolts of, of that. All right, so now uh, I think we're gonna open things up for some questions. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. We do have a question. Um, this attendee wants to know what causes failures in 3D printing? So failures, it depends on what exactly you mean by failures, but you know, as far as um, you know, you go to your printer, you know, you, you send a job to go at night, you come in in the morning all happy to pull your case out and finish it, and you have like half a case or something happened there, right? That's I find it's it's not being hygienic with your printer, uh, not keeping your material clean of, of fragments that could be in there, not straining your material regularly. Um, I think that's in protecting the film on whatever material, whatever 3D printer you're using. There's a thin film there on most of them. And if that gets scratched or damaged in any way, that'll cause you troubles. Cold, some machines out there don't heat the base and material. And if your material gets too cold, especially again in the winter time, it'll change a lot. Um, and sometimes you won't get an adhesion to that build plate and, and that could cause a problem. Um, if you're talking about failures in the actual materials themselves, well, that's the materials themselves. Now, you don't wanna leave these, our material or any material in, in your alcohol cleaner too long. That is a solvent and it, it not only cleans them, but it'll start to break them down. So that's very important. Um, you follow the manufacturer's recommend time to be in that uh, cleaner and that's it. Don't go to lunch and come back later. That, that'll definitely weaken in models or appliances. So hopefully by what you were asking that uh, answers what you might be looking for. That was another question that you touched on. What does, it, uh, what does temperature play uh, a role in the process? And you touched on that if it's too cold. Um, is there anything else about temperature? If it's, if it's too no, hot. But it, yeah, it does remind me of, you know, one thing I really didn't touch on is the processing, the curing process for this material is very unique. And so once you clean it, you actually put it into a light cure unit, the one that we use now, Sprint Ray, right? That's, we have all our times set up and, and for it to deal. And that's one thing I want you guys to realize and something I really learned through this is don't get all um, haphazard with the materials that you use in your machine under different settings. It's amazing what I've learned as far as uh, the amount of science that goes into dialing these materials into a specific machine and then to the light cure box uh, that's used. So don't just grab some light cure box and say, I oh, will get it. Like, you know, it's, it's not all the same. So be very careful with that. But yeah, so this material goes into the light cure, like just about any others. And you just follow the manufacturing time in there as well. But then it actually goes into a hot water bath. 80 degrees Celsius, right? So that's 80 degrees Celsius, right? So that's 160 something degrees. And it actually cures, it's like an annealing for that material. And um, and so it's really unique that way. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why you get such strength um, for the materials, you know, it's it's unique. It's the, the chemistry of this material is like nothing we've seen in this industry, really any industry. 